nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been. And am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dull. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insight. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. He had the eye of a... a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night about... Yes, about this time, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it. Oh, so gently. I put in a dark lantern, all closed. Closed so that no light shone out. Then I thrust in my head. You would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly. Very, very slowly. So that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Had a madman been as wise as this? Would he? Would he? And then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But the eye always closed. So it is impossible to do the work. It was not the old man who vexed me. It was his evil eye. And every morning when day broke, I went boldly into his chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. You see, he would have been a very fond old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. On the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. Never before had I felt the extent of my powers, of my sagacity. 
I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. I think that there I was, opening his door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I barely chuckled at the idea. His room was black as pitch. I started to undo the lantern. My thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? He kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in bed, listening. Just as I have done night after night. Harking to the death watches in the war. Presently I heard a slight groan. And I knew it was a groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief, oh no. It was the low stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and I pitied him, although I chuckled. I knew he had been lying awake ever since that first slight night. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it's nothing but wind in the chimney. Only a mouse crossing the floor. It's only a cricket that has made a single chirp. Yes. He had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but had found all in vain. Death, with his black shadow before him, had caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within his room. I waited a long time, most patiently. Then I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length, a single dim ray like the thread of a spider shot from the lantern and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open. Wide, wide open. And I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person. For I had directed the ray, as if by instinct, precisely on the damned spot. I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses. Now I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates a soldier into courage. The Mieta refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. You mark me well. 
I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. Amid the dreadful silence of that old house. So strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. For some moments longer I refrained and stood still. The beating grew louder. Louder. And now a new anxiety sees me. The sound will be heard by a neighbor. The loud yell I left into the room. Sweet once, once only, the old man's hour had come. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. Yet for many minutes the heart beat on with muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the war. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I examined the corpse. He was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon his heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. You still think me mad. You will think so no longer when I describe the wise precaution that I took. For the concealment of the body. The night waned. And I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing. Nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I'd been too wary for that. A tough had caught all. When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. Went down to open it with a light heart. What had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. Smiles. What I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man was absent in the country. 
I led my visitors all over the house. I made them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasure, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigue. While I, myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon this spot, beneath which reposed the corpse of my victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. Ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. Headache, and I fancied the ringing in my ears. They sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling. It continued and gained definiteness. Until at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. But I found I grew very pale. I talked more fluently with heightened voice. Did the sound increased. It was a low, dull, quick sound. Such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath. Yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently. The noise steadily increased. I argued about trifles and high key with violent gesticulations. It increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. What could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the seat upon which I'd been sitting and grated it upon the wall. The noise arose all over and continually increased. Louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted and smiled pleasantly. Is it possible they heard it not? No. No. He heard. He suspected. He knew. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear these hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. Louder. Louder! Villains, I shriek! Assemble no more. Beating of his hideous heart. 